and our eye, Commissioner Hulley. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks very much, uh, Cahirlach. And I very much welcome the opportunity uh, to be here today uh, to discuss the publication of the CSO uh, survey providing national prevalence figures on sexual violence in Ireland. And I want to thank the House for facilitating this discussion. The Sexual Violence Survey 2022 focused on respondents' experiences of a broad spectrum of sexual violence and harassment experience in their lifetime. And I think it's entirely appropriate that the Dáil has an opportunity to consider this important research. There's no doubt that many of the figures and statistics are shocking. As you will know, the survey covers a range of behaviours from non-contact sexual violence right through to non-consensual sexual intercourse or rape. It tells us a lot. It tells us that 40% of people in Ireland have experienced sexual violence at some stage in their lives, and that for women this rate is 52% and 28% for men. It tells us that 18% of adult women and 3% of adult men have been raped. It's difficult to even comprehend and let alone say it out loud. 18% of adult women and 3% of adult men have been raped. At times it's difficult to read, oftentimes it's sobering. And at times while reading, I think you need to stop for a moment to consider the import of individual results and statistics and the potential reasons behind them. For example, that younger people reported higher levels of sexual violence. That 80% of those who experienced sexual violence knew their perpetrator. Or that females were more likely to disclose sexual violence than men. There's much to reflect on, and for us as policymakers and as lawmakers there certainly is, but also for the wider Irish society. And I'm acutely aware that behind these numbers are individuals real people who suffered at the hands of someone else. And I'm conscious that we must be careful not to re-traumatise victims and survivors. But this data is necessary, and I believe the importance of the study cannot be overestimated. We knew that this was an area of crime that has tended to be underreported, and that the numbers that we've had up to now did not reflect the true extent of the problem. That's why my department commissioned the CSO in 2018 to undertake this wide-scale survey. And I want to thank all those who engaged with the CSO, and in particular the approximately 500 people who disclosed for the first time that they had been subjected to sexual violence. In engaging in this survey, you've helped us. You've helped us understand the extent of the problem we face, and as a government, you've helped us understand that, and I think you've helped us understand it as a country. This exceptionally comprehensive, nationally representative survey gives us a new baseline on the prevalence of sexual violence in Ireland. And as we can use this baseline, to measure the impact of our work across government on this priority issue. We can also develop policy and provide the necessary supports and services. It bears repeating that the figures are devastating, including that one in five women have been raped. Equally as stark and upsetting is that we know from this study that the vast majority of these victims and survivors knew the person that did this to them. Presumably in many cases it was a person that they once trusted. I firmly believe that these statistics underline why we need to take a zero-tolerance approach to the third national strategy on domestic sexual and gender-based violence. This is an ambitious five-year programme of reform to achieve a society which does not accept sexual violence or, crucially, the attitudes which underpin it. That societal change, that cultural shift is key. The strategy's accompanying implementation plan, which runs to the end of this year, sets out 144 detailed actions which are assigned to my department and to other agencies and other departments across government. A key part of the implementation will be the establishment of a new statutory DSGBV agency, which will ensure a permanent and dedicated focus on this important area of work. I'm pleased that I recently secured government approval for the drafting of legislation to create this agency. It will be tasked with ensuring the delivery of excellent services to victims of sexual violence and will have specific functions related to data and research to ensure that our information remains up to date and in line with best practice. The agency is a whole of government priority and we intend to have it up and running by next January, as indicated in the strategy. Other strategy priorities include to double the number of refuge spaces during the lifetime of the strategy, to strengthen our legislation both in order to better support victims and to introduce new offences and increase maximum sentences for perpetrators to expand the range of supports available to victims no matter where they live in our country, and to work at a societal level to continue to raise awareness of what constitutes domestic sexual gender-based violence, change attitudes to it, and signpost victims and survivors to supports. But the actions within the strategy reflect the importance of a range of areas, including education, training, awareness raising, supports, and importantly and crucially, having a victim-centred approach to all of our work in this priority area. The need for an evidence-based policy approach to all of this is obvious. 
It will increase our understanding of sexual violence and it will help us in government and in society more generally continue our work towards that shared goal of zero tolerance. We'll now start working with the CSO to design and carry out a national prevalence survey on domestic violence and both the sexual violence and the domestic violence prevalence surveys will be repeated alternately every five years. Going forward, this will help us keep our national data up to date and the importance of having robust data, I think, is accepted by all and stressed throughout the strategy. It's evident that in a number of specific actions, and is included as a specific function for the new statutory-based agency, who will be tasked with developing a data and evaluation strategy to ensure that there are shared definitions and agreed methodologies for collecting, analysing and sharing data on access to and use of services. Why do we want this information? We need this information so we can do better, and so we will be better. While this strategy is our most ambitious to date, it builds on work already undertaken under previous strategies and under supporting a victim's journey, our plan to create a more victim-centred criminal justice system. Through the supporting a victim's journey plan, a number of recommendations to support victims of sexual crime have been progressed. These include recommendations on the investigation and prosecution of sexual offences, the introduction of trained intermediaries, actions of training for frontline professionals, which includes the provision of specific training for all of the key people that a victim comes into contact with during their course of their journey throughout the criminal justice system, and the nationwide rollout of divisional protective service units. This work has been built into and will be further progressed by the third national strategy and it will an action seeking to reduce the delays in the trial process. While significant legislative advancements have already been made, I want to briefly mention some areas we're currently progressing including making stalking and non-fatal strangulation standalone offences. That legislation passed this House when I go to the Shannon. Increasing the maximum sentence for assault causing harm, one of the most likely criminal offences that a victim will encounter from domestic violence. Expanding the existing harassment offence, strengthening the law on consent, extending victim anonymity to further categories of victims. And I, I, can I just say, I think this is absolutely crucial. I hear this from victims regularly. I hear this from families who supports uh, them and provides them with supports in the court service. And extending that victim anonymity coupled with making provision for legal representation for the victim. So it's not just the state and their team and the perpetrator team, but that the victim has that voice in the court is really important too. Rep repealing provisions for sentences to be delivered in public. Ensuring character evidence in sentencing for sexual offence trials can be tested. This has been a source of great pain for so many over the last number of years, and the character of witnesses can be cross-examined. And preventing a defendant who is a lay litigant cross-examining vulnerable victims in trials for certain offences, including coercion, uh, to prevent further traumatisation. I also know recently welcomed the enactment of the Sex Offenders Amendment Bill, which will improve the management and the monitoring of sex offenders in the community to protect the public, including through the use of electronic tagging. We know the importance of criminal justice, of strong legislation, of reporting, of supports for victims and of a coordinated approach in our work with victims. But I believe the fundamental weapon that we have in the fight against sexual violence is and always will be prevention. It's that huge piece of work around changing attitudes and social norms as to what is acceptable. Recognising the importance of awareness raising in this space, the strategy includes actions around a number of ambitious campaigns which will focus on the attitudes of men and boys, we can't remove ourselves from this conversation, increase awareness of service and support among victims, reach migrant and minority communities, as well as the rollout of a national campaign on consent. Last month my department launched a significant new awareness campaign highlighting the rights available to victims of crime with a particular emphasis on reaching minority and harder to reach communities. This month we'll be launching phase two of our intimate image abuse campaign, which will focus on the crime of threatening to share intimate images without consent, which is often used as an element of coercive control. It's an offence to share an intimate image, but it's actually also an offence to threaten to share, and we'll be very clear on that in our new public awareness campaign. We strongly believe that having a shared understanding on the meaning and importance of consent can play a key role in reducing instances of sexual violence, and later this year we'll be launching a campaign to highlight the importance of consent in healthy sexual relationships. Already we've been working closely with the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre to fund their research on consent in Ireland and I was delighted to recently launch their We Consent campaign which will help start the discussion on this topic. We know that well-developed and executed campaigns can have a strong impact on bringing about a change in societal behaviours and attitudes. We've successfully done this in the recent past through campaigns such as No Excuses and What Would You Do? And I'm confident we'll continue to deliver excellent results in our forthcoming work. The CSO will rightly be busy too, and I want to thank all those involved in putting together this huge piece of work, which is the culmination of five years of research and development. Carrying out this survey was a big ask of the CSO, and I'm extremely grateful to them for taking the time to design and execute this survey in such a comprehensive, but importantly, trauma-centred way. I really thank them for that. I know they'll be releasing a number of very significant thematic reports relating to this prevalence survey over the coming months that will provide further information on the types of behaviour involved, frequency of the experiences, and on discourse and societal attitudes. 
These two will be hugely important for helping us understand the extent of the problem and addressing the intersectional needs of different groups, something we're determined to do. To conclude, much of the data to come out of the sexual violence survey is stark, it's difficult, but it's sadly unsurprising. It's accepted, for example, that when it comes to reporting incidences of sexual violence to a Garda Shia Kona, reporting rates are much lower than the prevalence rates. We need to understand why this is and how we can fix it. We need to understand the full breadth of the problem. And this report does provide that data, does provide that clarity. The results give us a new baseline for the prevalence of sexual violence in Ireland, and we can now use it better to provide supports and services, as well as measuring the effectiveness of measures that we put in place to tackle these heinous crimes. We'll continue to work to improve our criminal justice system, to make it more victim-centred, and ensure that victims have the confidence to report what has happened to them, confident in the knowledge that they'll be supported at every point and by everyone they encounter on their journey. We remain deeply committed to this. Its implementation and the third national strategy's implementation is instrumental in ensuring that we have a criminal justice system that works for vulnerable victims at every stage of their journey. And I want to thank my colleague, Minister Helen McEntee, for all her work in relation to this. Regardless of the circumstances in which sexual violence occurs, a victim of these horrific crimes should never be concerned about reporting what has happened to them and seeking the help they need and the justice that they deserve. They can and they should report what has happened to Garda Shia Kona. And I want any victim or survivor listening to this today to know that there is now specially trained Gardaí in every Garda district to engage with and support victims of sexual violence, no matter where you live in this country. Lastly, I again want to recognise the individual stories of bravery, courage and resilience that form the background to these statistics. This is a report of statistics, but behind each statistic is a person, a person who came forward and has helped Ireland towards our journey to zero tolerance. I extend my personal thanks to them. Their willingness, their sharing of their experience is truly appreciated and will help us create a better country.